I think uh, that what I'm going to talk about is mostly hourglasses, uh, a fairly old hourglass, the first, a more recent hourglass, and then I was gonna wrap things up talking about how I spent my Christmas vacation. So let's start with hourglasses. ACM did me a big favor by putting uh, an hourglass on the cover of their July issue uh, with the lead article being about the hourglass model. It's something that if you're networking, you know about, you were taught about it, uh, but you may not have been taught uh, where it came from uh, in looking at the references in this article Certainly the author, author of the article didn't know where it came from, but he did know that it was successful and had some good data on why. Uh, this is the origin of the hourglass. Read that, I'll talk over it. The, you probably don't know, unless you're a historian, that when uh, Bob Kahn and Vince Cerf first came up with TCP IP, TCPIP was one protocol, uh, and it was closely modeled on the ARPANET's uh, host to IMP protocol, so it did both transport and datagram forwarding. They were trying to generalize it. They put an architecture team together, led by Dave Clark, to finish the details. One of the first members of that team was a guy from ISI named John Postel, who looked at the specification and said, this is utterly wrong. It's completely broken. You put a transport protocol, which is only needed by endpoints, together with the packet forwarding protocol, which is needed by everything. And that's going to screw us up. We're, it's going to make the implementations too big, too brittle. You're going to have the wrong functions in the wrong places. You need to straighten it out. And his argument was basically this one. Now, at this time, there was no OSI model. There was barely networking. There were a lot of vendor protocols. The end goal of networking was for big vendors to lock in their customers. So. The intent of the protocols was to make them all different and unique and to suck in your customers and make sure that they couldn't leave you for some other vendor. Uh, that's not the world's greatest architectural principle. So the phone company people said, well, yes, we certainly want lock-in, but we have to interoperate with phone systems around the world and we need to be able to ship data. We should come up with a standard. So they chartered an ISO OSI working group to come up with an internetwork data architectural specification, INWG. INWG was formed in 1977. That's the same time John wrote this. They came and talked to ARPANET people and to this internet architecture group recruited some of them to work together, and eventually, six years later, came out with the OSI layer cake. But that's not the starting point for the internet. The starting point for the internet was John saying, the structure of our world is this. There's only one piece, that thing in the middle, that has to be everywhere. Everything else is sitting on individual hosts or individual wires. The thing that has to be everywhere, you want it to be absolutely bulletproof, you want it to be really simple, and you want it to be a foundation that you can build on above and below, and the foundation's not gonna ever change. Because if it changes, everything that rests on it is going to have to change. And that's gonna really stifle the innovation. So. John drew an hourglass and said, look, this is the way the world should be shaped. We get a narrow waist in the center, which has to be everywhere. Above it, we can put our transport protocols, more the better, lots of experimentation. Below it, we can put lots of different interfaces, the more the better, lots of experimentation. 
in the middle, we're going to do this thing that's going to be as simple as we can possibly make it, and we're never going to let it change. Uh, so this is a great idea. It's a unique idea. It's probably the foundation that made the internet fabulously successful because it really allowed a lot of innovation at a time when innovation really wanted to happen, both in the communications technology and the computing technology that wanted communications technology. That picture, this narrow waist, is not something that God gives you. It's something that you make. It's hard engineering to take the what the world has got, which looks a lot like a layer cake, cake and Actually, when everybody starts, you're doing networking technology, so everybody wants to put their own best ideas into the networking technology. So that rather than getting an hourglass, you get something that's more shaped like a barrel because everybody working on the network wants to put their favorite thing into the network. John was successful in arguing split out TCP from IP. His arguments were so cogent and it was clear that he deeply understood simplicity and why you wanted to get simplicity, the Internet Architecture Group said, you know, we're going to put you in charge of Internet standards, so you get the final say on what everybody does. Right? If you don't like it, don't publish it. It's not a standard. Nobody can do it. So they made John RFC editor, which was a position of tremendous power, he was the gatekeeper for everything that went into the internet for the next 20 years that he was alive. Uh, and I published a few RFCs. I remember whenever you went to John and said, I would like to take something out of IP, you got this big smile, no problem. It sailed through, got published in a week. When you came in, said, I want to add something, get this frown, why? Do you need that? Can't you do that another way? Isn't there an existing facility? Are you sure you thought that through? Is there a real use case? You get many weeks of grilling, then you get a bunch of people recruited that ask you new questions, that try to justify it. And if you kept arguing, proving your case, had an absolutely compelling case, you know, maybe after half a year, you would get an RFC out of it. You know, if you went, look, the TCP window is too damn small. We can't. The way that we're evolving interfaces, there's no way that we can get enough data in flight with 16 bits. We need to do something to expand it. And a year and a half later, we got that as an RFC. But uh, a particular place where John just really told the hard line was on IP. For if you look at the history of the first five years of the internet, we spent pretty much the entire five years taking things out of IP. Things that had seemed like good ideas at the time, like ICMP error messages, uh, precedence bits, ability to have some source routing, so if the routing structure was misbehaving and it was always misbehaving, you could go around it. it. It turned out that these were all bad ideas. The whole notion of IP options were, turned out to be bad ideas. So. Over the five years, they were deprecated, both in host requirements and gateway requirements and implementation guidelines. And though you can't ever remove something, you can make it so that something is never used. And uh, for things like IP options at the point where uh, routers and gateways and firewalls started to routinely remove them, turned out there weren't any. So. Mission accomplished. Uh, the end result was we've been using basically the same IP for the last 35 years. After that five years of cleaning it up. There are two things that were added that I remember. One was uh, the quality of service bits were this real mishmash that were reported directly from the military, like they included your rank as you know, general packets go ahead of captain's packets. Uh, 
and then they included some uh, fairly strange quality of service bits. Uh, Kathy Nichols, who's sitting there, led an ITF working group that redefined that as uh, six bits of more general purpose use that came about by a mutual agreement called DiffServe. So that was one change. It was a simplification uh, and a reinterpretation of an existing field. The other one was Steve Deering's work on multicast. There was an address space put in place, but there wasn't any way to use it. He worked out the way to use it, wrote some standards. That was pretty much it for IP. Big thing about making this narrow waste is it's got big do not enter signs on it. It's the only way that it's going to stay narrow because everybody wants to put stuff there, even though that's harmful in the long run. We unfortunately don't have a lot of John Postels in the world. It would be nice to get one on nearly every project because in the end, the thing that kills large endeavors like big networks or big organizations, or big product groups, is complexity. No matter how good the ideas are, the weight of all the individual effort eventually prevents you from making any further progress, of making any changes. And so you need either a gatekeeper or you need an ethic that says, you really can't work in this space. This narrow waste is what enables work everywhere else to happen, but there has to be some fixed point, it has to be really stable, it has to be something that you can count on. Problem as you're doing new protocols is you want to try new ideas to see if they're good or bad. The thing that you can be working on is a layer three, and you want to say, what's its shape? One of the things that got removed fairly early on in IP was a particular kind of error message that was generated by the routing system back to hosts saying, the destination that you're trying to reach, I can't reach. The network's unreachable or the host is unreachable. Now, this seemed like a really good idea. Tell the host that oh, I, routing says you can't get there. In practice, in IP, the protocol only works because it delivers on a spanning tree. Between any pair of hosts, there can only be one path. Uh, it's a requirement, otherwise the data would loop. Routing, particularly in early days, was really flaky, so those paths would churn a lot. Metrics would change, links would go down, routers would abort. Routing was self-healing. It would find a new path. There could only be one, so when you lost lost one, there wouldn't, wasn't a hot standby, it would have to discover a new one. And while it was churning, you'd get a whole stream of these ICMP unreachables that just said, yes, routing's down again. It'll say, you know, give it a minute, it'll start to work. But hosts interpreted all of those ICMP messages as, oh my god, the world has ended. I don't have a route. And it would abort all active connections, which means that you couldn't keep a TCP connection up for a minute at a time unless you were talking in your local campus because routing just wasn't that stable. You kept getting all these ICMP messages that didn't mean much. It meant the network was healing itself and what you really wanted to do was to tell your host to ignore them, but the standard said it couldn't ignore them. It had to reset the connections. So I had to fix the host standard, fix the routers to not generate that. Seemed like a good idea. I mean, an error message, it's gotta be a good thing, but it's actually a really bad idea. So um, I got victimized that. I wrote some tools to try and figure out what was going wrong, who was sending those messages, why they were aborting the connection, so it resulted in things like TCP dump and trace route. Uh, Recently, Kathy Nichols has been doing some work on a monitoring system, uh, network measurement system for NDN, uh, working with NIST. And uh, 
we've been talking a lot, and it had this funny problem of uh, it's all NDN based and interests were disappearing and we weren't getting data or it was taking a really long time to get data. And so uh, got some packet captures and we're trying to sort this out. And I'm bringing this up because it's this horrible sense of deja vu 30 years later. Um, so this is the way that interest data is supposed to happen in NDN, according to a lot of documents in the original conception. Uh, so it's a process A, a process B, and a network forwarding daemon, uh, NDN forwarding daemon in between them, NFD, uh, time going down. So something in A expresses interest in slash foo at once. I want some data from the namespace slash foo. So that makes a pending interest inside of A, which causes A to send an interest packet to NFD, which is the I with the carrot on it, uh, saying, give me a foo. That makes a pending interest inside of NFD, but NFD doesn't know how to get a foo at the time the interest arrives, so it just sits there as a pending interest inside of NFD. Sometime later, B comes up, says, oh, I've just started a process that can build foos. And so it registers with NFD saying, if anybody's interested in foos, send me the interest because I could probably answer it. And so there's a register that comes out of B. NFD gets the register, sets up the internal state to forward foos to B, and then says, I have a foo. Someone is interested in one. So it ships it to B. B now has a pending interest for foo. It internally constructs an answer for that interest and sends a data packet which satisfies its internal interest, causes the data to go on the wire, satisfies NSD's pending interest, and NFD forwards the data packet to A. Everything gorgeous, right? This is uh, express an interest in data when Ever the data appears, you immediately get that data. So that's what's supposed to happen. This is what was happening. So there was a facility added to NFD fairly recently to minimize the state on point-to-point -point links. It puts in a knack, so if you get an interest and a forwarding agent looks and says, well, I don't have any way to answer your question. I don't have a rib entry or a fib entry that would let me forward this interest, so I'm gonna send you back a NAC. It says, no, uh, I can't answer this question. I'll clear out the state. You know, if you've got a plan B, do your plan B. So the effect of that in a wireless multicast environment is a is interested in foos, sends its interest, NFD gets it, NFD makes a pending interest, looks and says, oh, I've got no registrations. I have to knack this because I can't satisfy it right now. So it throws away the pending interest, sends back a knack. That kills off A's pending interest. Sometime later, B comes up, does its registration, you know, a few milliseconds later, doesn't matter when, now all the interests are gone. So now you're counting on A periodically re-expressing the interest and you know, say every minute or so it asks, you know, are there any foos yet? It would finally get an answer, but after a very long time, which is exactly what we were seeing in Cathy's system, the interests were getting killed off. So if you get this incredible, I got this incredible sense of deja vu, you know, this, this is a network unreachable. It's an ICMP error message and it's blowing off the communication. Uh, it's well-intentioned, but uh, this is really not the kind of thing that you want in the waste, and NFD is the waste. Uh, the reason you don't want it in the waste is because it's a mechanism to inhibit communications, and if you want a communication system to be successful, 
you think once, twice, maybe 200 times before you put in any mechanism that inhibits communication. Anything that furthers communication, say, mm, yeah, I won't send that interest out one interface, I'll send it out over 100 because the data might be someplace else. When you're starting, that wants to be your attitude. Try to generate success, not generate failure. Clobbering state's not really the best thing to do if you're trying to get users happy with the speed and power of your interface. So that's a way of saying there, there needs to be keep out signs around the waste in any new networking protocol that you're doing. I'm just picking on uh, NDNs, NFD, but anything, you want to keep the waste as small as possible. Does that mean that innovation stops? Well, it didn't stop for the internet. There were these big honk and keep out signs, and what that did was to force the innovation at the places where it needed to happen, at the lower layers and the upper layers. So there's a host of opportunities. If, if you look at what drives protocol development and protocol architecture, you're basically driven by constraints. There are things that the world makes easy and things that the world makes hard, and you try and navigate a space around that. In protocol stacks, if you look sort of from transport down, you're thinking about data in motion, and you have to think through the constraints on data in motion, uh, what constraints, it, what assumptions are there, what abstractions need to be needed. Uh, you get those sorted out to try and get successful. If you look from sort of the network layer up, from packets going up towards applications, you think about the constraints of data being used. What do applications need? When do they need it? How reliable it is? How, can they, how much can they count on it? How fast can they get it? Uh, things that are sort of determined by the communication system, but these days can be really driven by the API. So within those constraints, if you're looking for new problems, here's a random sample. For NDN in particular, and uh, for ICN in general, you can do a lot more, a lot faster at the lower layers, because most information-centric systems, it, back up, with IP, data telephony, uh, things whose model is a wire over which you have a conversation. They, the conversation is a side effect. What the protocol and the network are trying to do for you is to build a wire over which you can have a conversation. And that's a really heavyweight abstraction. Right? If you think of people trying to get on the wireless. Right? You need to be authenticated with the access point. They do need to go uh, get a DHCP address. You need to get a, an IP address for your box. You need a router. The router has to be able to forward your packets. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you have to set up. And the fact that you've got a carrier from the wireless that the RF is working and delivering bits means nothing because it can be another 10 or 15 minutes until you can actually use those bits. And all of that time is spent building abstractions. In ICN, if you've got carrier, you're good to go. Right? You can do the moral equivalent of walk into a room and say, where am I? What time is it? And somebody can answer. Right? It doesn't require any abstraction set up. The information transfer isn't reliant on anything else. It's not a side effect of the communication. The information is the communication. So there's things that you can do, both minimal latency to communication, using things much earlier than you could uh, with different uh, communication models, and not requiring, uh, not having to bind an abstraction if you've got a medium like uh, 
modes of Bluetooth that really don't want to make endpoint addresses, you say, fine, BTLE, love it. It's sign packet out, sign packet back. And there's the packets themselves are item potent. I don't need any addresses, not even MAC addresses. Great. You can do that you know, in a protocol friendly way. NDN will use that with a smile on its face. Another layer up, if you're doing information-based transfer, you don't require a spanning tree. You're not building a circuit, you're not building a path. Data can't loop because the data is held in any intermediary. So if another copy shows up, you say, oh, I've already got that. It's the basic, basic mechanics of flooding that we use to build our topologies because you know, before you've got a spanning tree, you have to make it. And what protocol do you use to make it if you don't have it? Well, you use a flooding protocol because it's a protocol that's immune to loops. So that's intrinsic in NDN and other ICN architectures. What that means is particularly today where everything has got really rich communication, you've got your Wi-Fi, your Ethernet, your Bluetooth, infrared, IoT, you've got uh, Zigbee, Z-Wave, uh, probably a camera so you could do optical mic so you can do audio. You could use all those modalities, you could use them all at the same time, which means that from a user's point of view, you can make devices uh, that say, all right, turn me on, and I'm going to figure out how to talk in the environment that I'm in. I'm going to look for, is there a Wi-Fi? Is there a device that will give me a Bluetooth setup? Is somebody shining a camera at me? Um, is there an ultrasonic signal that I can interpret? So you can make things that are just way more bulletproof because they're not saying, oh, well, I can't do anything until I get an IP address and I know about a router and I know what the net mask is, something that's really timid and just absolutely isn't going to work. And you say, ah, yeah, well, we'll figure out, we'll take you over to some cloud router uh, you know, on the other side of the internet and you can tell it your problems and it'll tell you how to configure your, yourself. And instead, you can say, no, uh, the device itself using its multiple ways to communicate, it's going to make this work. So nobody's doing any work there if you're looking for a project. Lots of great projects not, don't have anything to do with the narrow waste. You could just use the narrow waste. Keep going up. As you're moving closer to applications, uh, this particular hourglass was drawn with a dotted line between uh, the application data model, where there's chunks or maps or commands, uh, and security and transport. And loop comes together security and transport because they're just different aspects of the same problem. Information that you can't trust is not information. Thinking that you didn't think, have to think about communication architectures uh, about security in a communication architecture is a particular kind of 1960s brain damage. It was, you know, we didn't have an internet and we were all friends. Um, I think we've been cured of that brain damage. We, uh, we're not all friends and the outtackers uh, outnumber the defenders. You think a lot about security and it should be an intrinsic part of what you're, you're doing but then you have the issue that it's really hard. Uh, it gets easier if you can take that stuff that's right above the waist and make it all work together. View it as uh, something that knows about the application's model and what it's trying to accomplish, the application's security and trust models. Uh, how does it decide what data is good and not good? Um, and then the network's means of transporting data. That how do you move it? Uh, what are the goals of doing the transport? Um, if, if you view that as something that uh, 
rather than TCP one size fits all is something that you can design around a particular application or a particular set of applications. It's what Kathy Nichols coined bespoke transport. Uh, and uh, long ago, as we were doing the M-Bone conferencing tools, uh, Dave Clark, John Romke, and I called it application layer framing, or ALF. Uh, it's the same idea that you should not view things above the waist as a bunch of separate layers, because they're not. They, they interact in curious ways. If you took that idea just a little bit further, so this is the how I spent my Christmas vacation. Kathy's doing this secure uh, network measurement architecture. So classically, you think of that as, all right, I designed the networking part, and I designed the security part, and I smash them together, and I should get something that works. Uh, but there's a different way to think about it where the security doesn't fight you, but it helps you. And um, the analogy I think of is if you're doing a big construction project, this particular set of plans is from the solar system currently going on to our house. Um, the, the plans accomplish three very different things. One is a validation step where the only way you're gonna get a building permit is if the plans completely meet the code. Uh, and so you go around with the county multiple times until they do meet the code. Once you've got conforming permitted plans, you give them to a builder who uses them to actually build the thing that you're asking for. And when the thing is finally built, an inspector comes by and uses the plans to make sure that what was built matches what was permitted. If you had a security architecture which essentially was giving you the plans for your communication. So this is what messages have to look like. This is their structure. This is a complete syntax. Here's what the signing chain looks like in order to be a valid, actionable message. It has to have this set of signing keys, keys of this particular form. Uh, you, you use that set of plans, we have that a thing, uh, an architecture for that in Indiana, it's called trust schemas. They're a set of plans that let the receiver completely validate the syntax and authorizations and access rights of every incoming message. But you can flip that and say, well, they're plans. They fulfill three roles, not just one. So you could use them on the sender side, right? If the plans tell you exactly what a valid message looks like, the sender could use it to build a valid message. If the plans tell you what keys are needed to sign a particular message, the, on the builder side, the, the sender side, the same plans can look through your keys and say, all right, do you have the keys that are necessary to generate this message? If not, I'll tell you you're missing this key. If you do have a key that will sign it, I'll pull that key out of your key store and I'll use it. Don't have to have any user interaction. Right? All of the information is there in the security. This seemed like a cool idea and it makes the security and the transport partners they work together and they each simplify each other's life. Uh, so I spent my week over Christmas putting together uh, an invertible bloom lookup table based pub sub transport uh, and then uh, a special form of NDN trust schemas sitting on top of it that worked in a very tight concert. Uh, I'm going to talk not about the pub sub transport, though I think it's fairly cool. IBLTs are the most amazing innovation in transport that I have ever seen. I mean, literally, it light years beyond TCP because it's the first time where 
you don't have communication state associated with transport, which is what always killed us doing multicast transport, because you always, TCP or endpoint models, you need pairwise state. In IBLTs, the data you hold is the transport state. And if everybody's holding different data, good. That's what you want to tell one another so that you can all get to a point where you hold the same data. Uh, so you can do really simple, really fast, really robust transports uh, with a very general framework. Uh, I think it hasn't been nearly exploited enough. There's been some use of it, but not nearly enough. And it led to 300 lines of pub sub that does everything that MQTT does securely and without a broker, with no centralized point of control. So, uh, but I want to talk about the security part. So, uh, this is a skeleton of trust schemas. The, uh, I, so it's a whole lot easier to secure a small environment rather than a global environment, and a nice thing about a lot of ICN models is they don't say, oh, unless you've got a certificate that's globally valid, I don't want to talk to you about security. Um, they say, yeah, if you've got a key pair for your house, then it'll secure your house. And uh, we love to have local trust routes. In security terms, it should make a much stronger system because attacker uh, can't compromise everything. They, they might be able to compromise anything, but if every house on the planet has its own root keys and economies of scale get, let you get fairly simple key management hardware so that it's hard to expose those root keys, it's a lot harder to crack anything because there are no high value targets. Um, so, Networks got a network key. All the devices in the network. Networks local, like an IoT network. Um, and the gray lines are there's a trust chain derived from that network key that signs a set of certificates, eventually going down to uh, clients that are going to send packets, and they have to have a key to sign that packet. And uh, devices. In Kathy's architecture, there's a thing called a network observer daemon that takes data out of its local environment, IP data or N NFT data, and will return it to clients. They both have signing chains that uh, finally terminate in their keys. You get the mutual trust because uh, those keys all terminate on the network's trust anchor. It's essentially saying, I know I can trust you if we work for the same boss. A thing that's different, that's not in the trust schema paper, but was intended in the original architecture, is a trust schema is the law of the land. It's the rules that everybody has to play by. You have to trust the law of the land. Uh, you can't let anybody make it up. And so, the trust schema itself needs to be signed. And it can't have, it has to have a hardwired trust chain. Uh, so in this architecture, there's an installer key signed by the, the trust anchor that allows an installer to sign trust schemas. And the way that you enable communication is you make up your trust schema, uh, give it to an installer and say, if you want to run my cool stuff on your network, please sign this key. That gives you a trust schema that's been authorized to operate on the network, it's verifiable and signed. Uh, the signed things, NDN already has a great key management architecture. Make lots of keys, you gotta be able to move them around. It's easy to do in ICN. For things that want to be signed and have their trust validated, a convenient form to represent them is a key because that's what a key is. It's something that's got a name. Uh, it's signed by 
some authority, and it's got a payload that's unspecified. Uh, in particular, for us, it can be the trust schema. There is a trust schema that's written, a language that's written in the papers on them. It is implemented by uh, a general purpose regular expression verifier inside of NDN that's not a way that you want to implement trust schemas. Uh, okay, if you say regular expression verifier to attackers, they get a big smile because they say, oh, there's going to be lots of holes in that. Uh, particularly all of the schemas that I've seen, not for, first, for fundamental reasons, but just because the language isn't doesn't lead itself to error for your uses. Every trust schema currently in operation is insecure because the trust anchor is specified by a, a regular expression that has a star in it, a closure operation. That means that it's not monotonic, which means that, let me put it another way, if I'm at UCLA and I want to subvert UCLA routing, that top end of the UCLA routing trust schema says uh, slash NDN slash UCLA.edu slash some other stuff. The top end and the bottom end are specified, but not the middle. If I get a key, any key from UCLA, I get a nonce key when I'm visiting there. As long as it starts with NDN UCLA.edu, I can take an appropriate bottom end for uh, NDN routing at UCLA, tack it onto that key, present the whole thing, use it to sign a packet, a routing packet, and the UCLA router will happily eat that packet because it thinks I'm trustable, because it doesn't care what the middle of the key is because there's this closure operation in the specification. So there's a particular property that you want in verifiable security languages that there be monotonic, basically that as you go up the trust chain, the keys always get shorter or they stay the same month. That guarantees that the chain has got to terminate, can't take you round in loops, and you can't bootstrap from a, uh, a long key to be trusted by things that want shorter keys. So, this is a long way of saying doing a trust schema for good operational use, you want to build a language that lets you specify schemas that have a very high probability of being secure. Uh, so I wrote such a compiler it, with uh, Bison and Flex, writing a language takes almost no time. Uh, so it's a language that very closely follows what's in the paper. You can see some of it. Um, there are two topics in uh, the pub sub, one for commands, one for replies. Replies are sent uh, to commands by replacing the word command in the topic with the word reply. So the top gives you a very wordy form of the command packet and uh, the form of the search that supply it. And that bottom of last line says what the, uh, the CPAC, role cert, DNMP cert, net cert, that's what the trust chain looks like. And, uh, this next one says you make a reply by changing the word command and what the search look like and what the signing chain looks like. It's all monotonic, it's all verifiable, you can, statically check that every field that's marked as this needs to be verified, which is by default, it doesn't have the mark that says, no, don't verify this. Uh, every one of those fields is either verified or throws an error and says, oh, you have to fix this. The schema doesn't validate. When the compiler's all done, it makes a binary form that it stuffs inside of a self-signed key, which is what you present to the installer to get signed to actually make an installed trust schema. So you can go from a 
compact, verifiable description into uh, a very compact binary representation that you can validate really quickly uh, because it's small, it's got all of the linkages in it that, so that you can test things again. You know exactly what to test against other things. Uh, it also completely defines the format of the packets, which means that that same description you can now use on the sender side, and it makes the code just really tiny. So this is a client in Kathy's system. Uh, I mean, this, this is the entire client. Now, this one asks every node that's in your system uh, what route it currently has to a particular prefix. It's what you could look at if you're getting black holes or routing inconsistencies. Um, the, uh, the code to do all of the work is the thing in between the try-catch. You make a thing called a shim that's for the command reply protocol, so that's CR shim. It's another 100 lines of code that reads the trust schema, figures out what the topics are, and the one thing that you have to tell it is what your target is, because most of the uh, determining what key to use is largely constrained by which target you're talking to. If you're talking to your local node, you can do a lot. If you're talking to a foreign node or all nodes, you can do very little, maybe nothing. So uh, you tell it your target. You can send one publication, one command that goes to an arbitrary number of nodes. So you can get many replies back to that one command. Uh, so it says the timer says, I'm going to wait for 10 seconds for replies, and then I'll exit. I'll print out everything that arrives in the 10 seconds. That's what the schedule wait time does. Uh, and then you say, do a command, and I want to query the NFT rib, and I'm looking for a particular prefix. And when I get a reply, it executes that lambda, which just prints out the reply. And you can see in the printing, it's pulling fields out of the reply by name because it knows all the names because the names are in the trust schema because that's what you validate. You're validating a name in one key against a name in a different key of its signing chain. But that means to validate, you know the names, and so you might as well make them available to the user. The only thing that the code has to set up is what this code is responsible for. It knows it's written to do a particular command with a particular set of parameters for a particular target. That's all it says. The shim figures out everything else because everything else it can figure out from the trust schema. So the commands are guaranteed to be valid. There's no parsing and validating code because they were already validated against the schema. Uh, but the only thing that can happen is uh, some malfunctioning attacker, but most likely that's going to result in a reply that uh, fails validation. Uh, so you end up with really tiny, really secure code. Let's say the programs tend to be about 30 lines, and most of them work the first time. Uh, really surprising. The shims, which sort of embody the knowledge of the protocol, the shim knows because of the trust schema that we're talking about commands and replies, and replies are responses to commands. It knows exactly what the form's going to be. All of that in a general purpose library is about 100 lines. And finally, there's, uh, you know, that's for the entire shim, including the security. And then finally, there's this completely agnostic pub sub transport, and that's 300 lines. Uh, so, and it's all header only C++, which means that the code is small and blazingly fast because it's all compiled inline, but it also means that the attack surface is zero because 
There are no libraries. Uh, everything is wrapped up inside this one program, and it can all be fully validated at the time that you compile. You mentioned that uh, trust can effectively document the name space to some students. Saying you could pull the names uh, out of the trust. Can you talk a little more about how you envision using that? The schema definition, that weird language, which is going to not mean anything to you because it's all angle brackets and uh, tokens, but it's defining the detailed form in, in terms of which is going to turn into NDN data names uh, of a command and a reply. And you need that to validate. You, uh, you need to know that uh, commands have the word command at some place, that they have a root key, and it's exactly six tokens, and it's always at the front. And uh, it, the validator requires really detailed knowledge about both the name of the data units and the names of the keys that sign them. And if you keep that inside the validation structure, then uh, you can make all of those names available at the application level, which means they can just do symbolic reference to the fields that they need, which means that Applications could work with different schemas. It means that you can evolve the schemas and have multiple versions of them. You can change the form of the communication. You say, oh, I forgot to add a, uh, a sharding field so that I could handle really big replies. Um, no sweat. Stick it in. You don't have to change any code. You have to recompile things, but you don't have to change any code. Really bad. Uh, you, you were mentioning about how you had to keep IPs really simple, and right. it was always good to remove things mm. than to add things. So, are, is there a list of things you would like to remove from Indian today, if it were up to you? Um, well, let's see. I did remove NACs because they were uh, killing off Kathy's communication. Uh, they're uh, There are things that I think are of marginal utility, and um, my experience has always been it's better to leave those things out and put them in when there's a compelling need, because it's hard to remove things, but it's easy to add things. Um, and so there have been. Uh, you know, four to six things that were stuck into NFT that um, I would not put it into, uh, not require in a standard conforming implementation. Um, there are some really horrible mistakes. Early on, I put in uh, this thing called selectors, which uh, uh, there were things that you would put in an interest that uh, would let you exclude certain responses to your query based on key or name components or position in the name tree. The, uh, the reason for sticking it in was if you have a system that contains a lot of caching, you ask for something, you get an answer back, and there may be other answers and you want to see the other answers, how do you exclude the one that you've already got? Because if you ask the same question, you'll get the same thing. Um, turned out that A, selectors really can't solve that problem. B, it's a transport problem, not a network problem. The uh, problem is you're asking the same question. Ask a different question. If you're using transport like IBLT, you will, by definition, ask a different question because if you add another object to your set, it's now a different set, and what you're putting in your interest is the set you hold. Uh, so selectors are currently strongly deprecated. I don't believe 
they're used in any new code, and hopefully they'll go away in a generation. Uh, so uh, NDN has been moving, at least partly, in a direction of carving out the waste, but I think it could move more aggressively. And I think more particularly uh, for student efforts, uh, there was this 15 years of learning that the networking community got when we were doing the internet. And we got it because DARPA was funding every major university in the country, and they all wanted to use the network. They were all working on different pieces of it. They got, that generation of students got to see firsthand the kind of thinking that you need as you're doing an architecture. Um, and they got to see the mistakes, you know, like error messages. Well, certainly you want error messages. No, you don't want error messages. If it's something that the endpoints can't deal with, if it's a transient, but you can't know that it's a transient, you really don't want that stuff. So when to keep silent in protocols uh, that it's never simple enough, you know, that a little bit of complexity keeps adding up. All of those lessons were hard-won lessons in the architecture. It's unfortunately 40 years since the people that learned those lessons learned those lessons, which means that they're largely completely out of uh, the current students' circle of instructors. It would be nice, you know, the people like Leisha that were around in those days could inject it into the thinking of current students, not force them to make the mistakes and spend the next five years fixing them, but tell them, oh no, you know, I made that mistake in 1978. You don't need to make it, right? and here's why. So um, I, main thrust here is I'd really like to see more push in uh, from faculty to students on uh, narrow waste is important. Here's why it doesn't constrain you in any way. In fact, it opens up these vast new horizons and you should be excited about that. It doesn't have to do with your, your new transport you talked about. So uh, A, you know, you have a Uh, it has been implemented. Uh, it's not. It's running. It's not quite finished. It's GPL'd. It will be uh, on GitHub uh, certainly before the end of the summer. I was hoping to have it out there before the talk for both the transport and the validator and the shims. Uh, so, uh, and it's running over NDN. It's an NDN with that particular NAC bug and one other bug uh, fixed. It would run over stock NDN. It's just really slow because uh, you have to keep pounding NFT with interest to get good latency because they keep getting thrown away. Uh, but other than that, it's uh, a really bog standard NDN program and it just uses core NDN. Sorry, just uses what? It just uses the, the core of NDN, the the most minimal features. They're perfectly sufficient. Just quickly to Darlene's question, there there are some other IBLT-based protocols that are working on the existing libraries as well. They're probably not streamlined as this, but there are a few other examples. I think the full piece in but it's, uh, it would be interesting to talk about the uh, Yeah, there, there would be a, a long discussion about differences. Um, I think it's not using the full power of the, the representation, and there would be a great philosophy discussion there. Yeah, and there's a revised version that's sort of starting. 
I wanted to come back to the hourglass model where you said MDM runs on anything without added latency. And I'm pointing out to the lack of notification. You could have the case that because you don't have notification, you have added latency of a complete run trip. Because if you have a long lived interest to be notified of something, and then the event happens, you eat up all the long lived interest. And the time you need to reinstall the long lived interest has to reload when you are not notified about any changes. Yeah, so there's a race. Uh, we talked about it pretty much from the beginning. An interest is doing uh, multiple jobs. One, its main genesis was uh, uh, coming out of uh, IP multicast from the PIM multicast protocol where your uh, IGMP join was creating a path uh, from a receiver to senders by moving up the distribution tree from the receiver to it either met an existing uh, trunk of the tree or it got to the sender and that would uh, sort of graph the receiver into the tree. And it uh, sort of demonstrated the value of dynamic forwarding state for uh, having arbitrary any to any communication. Kind of opened my eyes to what you could do if you went beyond conversational communication. One thing that we could never do in IP multicast was to get a stable transport because the only way that we need we know to do stable transport is to have it run in flow balance. It's the, the balance between acts and data in TCP. You can do that in unicast around a loop, but when you've got arbitrary replication and mutation going on, you can't do that uh, on a distribution tree. It, Another realization was, well, you can't do it for the entire tree, but you can do it across every link. So if you've got an interest going up a link to pull a data down and the data annihilates the interest, then across that link you run in flow balance. There's an issue that, okay, now the interest is gone. What if there's going to be new data? Uh, the model has been, well, the interest goes into it meets the data, and if it can't find it at some intermediate point, it can go all the way back to where it's produced. It's also, if it makes it to some, data makes it to some intermediate point, then there had to be something downstream of that point that sent an interest. And, you know, otherwise it would never leave the original source. Uh, at that point, there's this thing called the content store that says hang on to it for as long as you can hang on to it. So if some other interest appears, it can grab that same data item and not lose anything. So uh, you're, you pay a round trip latency between events, but you don't lose any events. You get the first one if your interest is sitting there, you get the first one as soon as you could possibly get it. The second one, depending on the transport model, yes, you pay a round trip, uh, but it's a round trip to that intermediary. Problem is, we've tried the path where you don't have flow balance, where you don't have detailed balance. Frank Kelly in 1978 proved really unequivocally if you don't have detail balance, then your network will go unstable at some load. And we observe that, that uh, we could not keep multicast distribution networks stable under arbitrary load other than by driving to a lowest common denominator. So changing the interest semantics to lose the flow balance is a really big loss in terms of scalability of the protocol. So don't 
really want to go that direction, but we could talk about it. I have a question. So, so on, on the front of uh, not using an act, I, I, have a, I wanted to ask you for some comment. So, when you start storing stuff in the FIP, uh, in, in, in the FIP, when you send interest, there is also this uh, security attack that you could look at where I could just you know, completely overwhelm the FIP by sending requests that never materialize. So, and, and, and given that you don't nag back and you store that in the, the, the FIPs of India, how would uh, first, it, it's sort of painful as I look at the Indian source tree where I see three different versions of TCP congestion control and I don't see any version of NDN congestion control. Um, it seems like there's a funny set of priorities. The um, the thing that we were just talking about, the flow balance between interests and data is a really robust building block for congestion control and it's pairwise. So you don't have the long latencies and the own unknown bandwidth delay product issues that you have uh, with round the loop unicast congestion control. And you should be able to use that. The intent was that could be used, say, between NFDs and between clients and an NFD to strictly bound the number of outstanding interests so that you get fairness, so that you're not overwhelming the state. Because there's no reason to ship more interests than, say, a bandwidth delay product at the delivery pipe. Uh, If coming up, you have to find an NFD, it can announce that, oh, for this prefix, I'm going to take 10 outstanding interests. For that prefix, I'm going to take 30 outstanding interests because you know, this is what I know I need to, to give good efficiency. And if somebody sends more than that many interests, it can throw them away. There's, there's no binding contract. So um, I, I think the all of the variations of the state problem, uh, managing the volume of state, fair access to the state, not opening it up to, uh, to attacks. We've, we've got mechanisms to deal with those in a very principled way that sort of improves the performance of the scale and scalability of the system. It doesn't require any new mechanism. It requires being smart and observant about what happens, which is the fundamental of, of congestion control. So I, I don't think that NACs are the right answer. Um, and I think there's a really great problem sitting there for a variety of students to approach in uh, crafting what is the right answer, which is an ICN-centric congestion control. <laughs>